Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Happy Friday. Um, we welcome you to this uh, webinar about lipid formulations in drug delivery. My name is Daniel Peterson, and I'm the Business Development Manager at the Department of Chemical and Pharmaceutical Safety at RICE. Um, today, we have the pleasure to listen to two fine gentlemen, Bo Lassen and Dilip Urimi from RICE. Um, in order to have the best experience of this webinar, uh, I ask you kindly if you could please put your uh, phones and um, mics on mute. And also, um, you can choose the gallery mode. At the top of the page, you have show or visa in Swedish. You can put on gallery mode. You should get a better view experience. Um, and you are, of course, welcome to write questions in the chat. And we will take care of the questions accordingly after each speaker. Um, and uh, you, we are recording this uh, webinar, just to let you all know. And during the next week, you will be able to find it on our web page, as well as on our LinkedIn channel, Drug Development at RISE. All right, I think that will be it enough introduction it's lovely to see we are 30 listeners and um, i will now welcome our first speaker bo lassen uh, bo would you like to introduce yourself yeah good morning i hope you can hear me uh, as when i'm bo lassen i'm working at the rice chemical processes and pharmaceutical development in Södertälje and have been in the a social business for 30 years almost. The last 10 at RICE and previously mostly at AstraZeneca. That's the short introduction to me. So I will start to give a more overview type of presentation of lipids in drug delivery. I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. Someone just tell me if everything seems to be okay. It looks good. Oh. Fine. Okay. So lipids in drug delivery is the title of this overview of lipids in this respect. If I can get the thing working. Okay, there. So the, the outline, I, I first I will try to define what lipids, at least from this perspective, and why we're using lipids, and some ideas on how to formulate lipids. And I hope at least some of you will have this lipid on the right side here on today's break or lunch or dinner, so nice olive oil. So, I went to Wikipedia to get some definition of lipids. Uh, so they are telling that's a broad group of naturally occurring molecules, which include fats, waxes, steroids, fat soluble vitamins, and monoglycerides, diglycerides, phospholipids, and others. So that's quite a broad group of compounds and to cover today. And they may also be broadly defined as hydrophobic or amphiphilic, which means they have a both hydrophobic and a hydrophilic part divided in the molecule. The amphiphilic nature of some lipids allows them to also form structures such as vesicles, multilamellar, underlamellar liposomes, or membranes in the aqueous environment. So, so that's lipids. And lipids has been around in the or pharmaceutical application for at least 2,000 years or more. There's nothing new. So just to some list of lipids that are more common in the, some of the old one or lanolin or bull, bull grease or bull fat on Swedish. 
which is a prime as a mixture of primary long chain esters. It's other, another quite old group of waxes or fats or petrolatum or also called Vaseline or soft paraffin. It's more uh, some uh, uh, byproducts from the pharmaceutical industry or from the from the pet petrochemical industry, which is a mixture of hydrocarbons or normally more than 25 carbon. And then one of the most common groups are fatty acids, which we see almost everywhere. And we also have this, the, the fats or the glycerides, triglycerides, which are normal oil or fats. They can also have one or two of these fatty acids connected to them. So it's uh, based on this glycerol uh, base, which one, two or three fatty acids connect to it. There is there's also another group, maybe not less common in the pharmaceutical, but at least cholesterol are used in certain pharmaceutical ingredients or uh, products. Another common group are phospholipids, which is also based on the glycerol backbone and two fatty acids and this, uh, specific uh, phospholipid group, which could be in this case the choline, but there are also, also other uh, variants of the phospholipid uh, group. This is uh, also a sweet ionic, so this is also a little bit typical, so I had both a negative and a positive charge. And there's just one type of vitamin that's uh, vitamin E, which could be used in the or formulating uh, drugs. Uh, and then we also have some honest there's a lot of different uh, synthetic or modified, uh, in this case, the modified uh, fatty acid with a, a, a peg chain. There are a, a large number of this type of of fats or surfactants, which are also are called that can be used. Why do we use lipids? One of the main reasons is we want to solubilize lipophilic and polysoluble drugs to increase their bioavailability. So that's maybe the main reason why we're using lipids. But sometimes you also can use lipids to have a more controlled release, slower release of certain drugs. It can also be used to target specific parts of your body. And for topical application, you would also have this emollient properties that's useful for getting the right exposure to, to the skin. And also sometimes just for the feel, the perception. Uh, there have been also I've seen application where you have used uh, lipids to try to protect the API from degradation in the final product. And there are probably a lot of other reasons also, but those were the one I thought of at the moment. So then how do we formulate uh, with lipids? I mean, you can find lipids in almost every way I mean, this administration route available for, for human and also veterinarian use. And, uh, and how then we, I mean, we can just use for solutions, suspensions, you can make something emulsions, micro emulsions, liposomes, also normal parties. The two later one that will be in the next talk in more detail. So I will stay on the first three here in this presentation.
So solutions and suspensions has been used quite a lot for many poly soluble APIs. And the one example is cyclosporin. This is this formulates a liquid in different uh, fats, mixture of different fats. Uh, and they're often also used in semi-solids, uh, which is um, creams or at least ointments, which is more, more fat type. And uh, these types of systems can also be filled into hard shell capsules if they have a suitable melting point that are so they're not will leak out. You can also fill as liquid in in soft uh, capsules. The cyclosporin is, is one example there, but it's also for an oral uh, solution also. So then we go into a little bit more complex systems, which is quite old, but is the emulsions. The micro emulsion is a little bit more new type of systems have been around for since after the second world war. Uh, so emulsions I mean both emulsion and micro emulsion will require some kind of stabilizers or service active components that form these the structures. And uh, for in both cases, you at least for emulsion, you will always have two uh, systems or liquids that's not are uh, that are not miscible in each other. And in most cases, some kind of oil and water. In other areas, it could also be organic solvents and water. But that's normally not used in, in humans. Uh, in the mountains, are not thermodynamically stable, and it normally requires energy to form the emulsion droplets. Uh, Microemulsions, on the other hand, hand is uh, is also in requiring an amphibolic molecule that can self-assemble in either oil or water. And but from uh, for emulsion, I mean, that micro emulsion is not, is thermodynamically stable, and that can have some benefits. It also has some other benefits we'll talk about later. And it can it will be self assembled so it will require relatively little energy to be formed. So that's also a good thing about micro emulsions. Uh, so just to Talk a little about, about these molecules that are used in both cases. We need some amphiphilic molecules that have both an hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part, so they can be located in the area between on the surface between the, the oil and the water interface. So the hydrophobic part will protrude into the oil and hydrophilic into the water. Uh, one way to define these amphiphilic molecules is using the concept of hydrophilic lipophilic balance. So, uh, a molecule with or an amphiphilic, amphiphilic molecule with a low HLB has a or is soluble in oil and one with high is soluble in water. Uh, this is a very old and quite simplified principle to try to select the right uh, stabilizer for your system. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work, but this is a very good starting point. But uh, I will not talk about it here, but there are other techniques which RISE can help you with. Let's call surface activity difference, more complex 
system trying to find the right combination of all stabilizers. So emulsions, I mean, we have two general groups of emulsions. One is oil in water, where water is the main component, and then we have water in oil. And we have these stabilizers in the interface between the, the droplets and the continuous phase. And these uh, stabilizers could be any surface active molecules. It could also be proteins, could be polymers and particles. Uh, colloidal silica, for instance, can be used to stabilize these droplets. And also just to this uh, concept of continuous phase. I mean, a continuous phase is the, the phase where you can go from one point to the other without uh, going through the other phase. So going from, in this case, the oil droplet you need to pass the water phase to get to the next oil droplet. But the water, you can just go from one point to another without interfering with the other phase. This is just a list of typical surfactants and also uh, uh, something called the Griffin HLB number concept, which HLB that's useful for and how it will appear in, in water. So the high number will have a clear solution in, in water, but the low will, will be just not soluble at all or not even dispersible. And the low numbers are useful for water in oil emulsifiers. And high is for or intermediate or for oil in water emulsifiers. And the one with very high is more like detergent and solubilizers. So, as I said a couple of times, I think, is that the emulsions are thermodynamically unstable, which means that they will change by time. And there are several different processes that could happen in your emulsion systems. One of the most common is the population or coagulation. In Sweden, Europe, I think population is, is a loose aggregates, which are more or less reversible. But coagulation are more dense, harder uh, aggregates, which is not reversible. And uh, also emotional drops can coalesce into larger droplet, droplets in two droplets of the same size. This is a little bit different from the other one process we'll talk about later. So two droplets will coalesce into one larger drop. And then we have an, uh, some other quite common things seen that's the Ostwaller ripening. Uh, so the, the, I see there's a type where the coalitions of much of this not okay now it's okay. Sorry. Uh, so the last part is that small droplets, uh, the molecules, or at least the one at the interface, are more energetically unfavorable to be in a small droplet than a large one, which small droplets will be taken up by larger droplets. So the particle size will increase by time. Uh, as I said, the, 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 the emulsion, to form emulsion droplets, at least to form small emulsion droplets, will require quite a lot of energy. Uh, there are techniques. One is to try to find a, is to find a stabilizer that can be dissolved in the wrong phase. So if you 
would like to have an oil continuous system and establish would be soluble in the water phase. So and that's the one way. And in the next talk, you will hear another way to to do this phase inversion technique. Uh, and one of the one common standard emulsion on the market is interlipids for nutritional people uh, intravenous. So it's uh, just soybean oil and egg phospholipids and glycerol. It's a relatively simple combination, but it's been quite successful. And then we go is the last slide series or the next uh, is the microemulsions. So the liquid crystals are also some larger types of microemulsions. Mm, they are thermodynamically stable. They have a very low interfacial tension, which is the reason why they are thermodynamically stable. And that's also the reason why they are quite small. They can be small in sizes. That means they have large surface areas. And they have a potential to solubilize lipophilic API either inside the core of the, the structures or on the surface. Uh, normally, you need more surfactants than for emulsions or stabilizers. So, the very simple structure like the micelles, as you can see here, the type of very large complex structures. And uh, since they are thermodynamically stable, they will form spontaneous and very little energy is needed to form them, which is also a benefit. And this is a phase diagram of some type of uh, surfactant type. So we have uh, here is 100% water, here's 100% surfactants, and here's 100% oil. So in some areas here you will have it's just a standard emulsion with the same surfactant. But in others you will have either oil in water micro emulsions or water in oil. And then there are would be areas with more complex structures, liquid crystals or in bicontinuous continuous structures. And uh, then we also have other vesicles based on lipids. One is liposomes, which is a bilayer of normally of phospholipids, more like the cell structure, cell wall structure. And then there are lipid particles, more, more monolayer, and then you have an inside with a filled with lipids. So that, this is I think the last slide of my talk this morning. Thank you so much, Bo, mm -hmm. for a great presentation. We actually have a question in the chat. Uh, how do you know when you have a poorly soluble drug that you can use lipids to formulate it? And how do you know what lipid formulation to choose? I mean, the, the easiest thing that we normally do is to do a solubility screen where we are testing different lipids on systems and see if they are soluble or not. I mean, first of all, you know that it's not soluble in water or in anyway. So that's the first screen. And from that, you can normally pick out a suitable system to try to start looking into. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh... Another question, uh, if you would like to give the listeners the, like a key takeaway uh, based on your presentation, what, what would that be? I mean, lipids, well. In your, uh, like, in, in your topic, the key takeaways to, to all the listeners. And the key takeaway is um, most likely that don't forget lipids because more of the API today are very poorly soluble in water. So, so it, it's a very uh, interesting way to try to, to formulate and go to the humans with your new drug. 
Thank you. Uh, so before we move on to the next speaker, I would like to raise the question to you all. Do you have any more questions out there to Boo? You can raise your voice. Right. Then uh, I will welcome our second speaker, uh, Dilip Rimi. Uh, Rimi, uh, Dilip, please, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dilip Urimi. I'm working as a researcher at RISE in formulation unit. I started at RISE as a PhD student in 2018. And since then, I've been working with various types of uh, lipid nano formulations for various drug delivery applications. So let me share my presentation. I hope you see my presentation now. We do. Yes, thank you. So, so title of my presentation is lipid based nano formulations for drug delivery applications. So I'm going to talk about few case studies uh, that we did at RISE. So the first one is about liposomes, uh, which is a brief study that was performed quite recently. And the other one is about lipid nano capsules. And this is actually my PhD work that I did at RISE. So I'll go through this case study a little, little bit in more detail. So let's get started with case study one. So this is about preparation of liposomes with microfluidic approach. So liposomes are lipid vesicles, as you can see here. They have aqueous core uh, surrounded by a lipid bilayer. So, so the conventionally liposomes are prepared by film hydration method or ethanol injection method, wherein most often we need to reduce the size by another step. And, and that is often cumbersome. So microfluidic approach on the other side can offer uh, forming liposomes or single unilamellar liposomes using a single step process. And this process might, might offer better process control as well. Here I have this microfluidic chip. What happens in this is that we send in lipids from one channel, the other one on the buffer from the other channel. And these two phases mix in a microfluidic chip, as you see here. In this chip, and then uh, the, the product that comes out of the chip contains small unilamellar vesicles. So the objective of the study was as to see if we can make liposomes using microfluidic chip, and if we form them, uh, will the properties or will the morphology of liposomes is comparable to that of liposomes from, from the conventional methods. So what we did was we kind of changed the flow rates of a liquid phase and aqueous phase that flows in, into the microfluidic chip. Here is uh, some of the data. So here you see the particle size distribution uh, at uh, different flow rates. So different colors here depicts different conditions. For example, if you look at the blue one, so it has a flow rate ratio of two to one. It means for every milliliter of ethanol phase, we had two milliliters of aqueous phase flowing in the chip. And in this case, 10 to one, which is here, like uh, for every ml of ethanol phase, we had 10 milliliters of aqueous phase flowing in. So it means that it has a really high flow rate. Uh, and this is a much more diluted system. So, so with different conditions, as you see, when we increase the flow rate, uh, for, for example, in this case, from 1.5 to 6 milliliter per minute, the size of the liposomes was reducing. And this has been common across different conditions. For example, if we look at this orange one, so it had a flow rate of 4.4 ml per minute with a flow rate ratio of 10 to 1. So we, we have liposomes of around 100 to 200 nanometers in diameter. So we took this sample, we did cryo-TM imaging, and you can see here like a nice uh, unilamellar uh, liposomes, and you can also see bilayers actually. And, and this is also, I mean, the other picture is also from liposomes that was prepared using ethanol injection method. So, so as you, if you compare, so the morphology of liposomes is quite similar between these processes. So the message is that we can make unilamellar vesicles using microfluidic approach, and this process is quite flexible. Depending on your application, you could choose different conditions to get to de desired sizes, actually. 
Uh, so, so the next the next case study is that uh, this is about my PhD work, as I mentioned before. So, in so the objective was to come up with a delivery system to use in treatment of inherited retinal degeneration. So, here is a brief background about the work. So, so retinal degeneration is a group of blinding disorders, and this is characterized by a progressive loss of retinal photoreceptor cells that are responsible for the vision. So here I compare the healthy retina versus the retina in retinal degeneration. In the healthy retina, you can see the retinal photoreceptor cells clearly, and those receptor cells are lost completely during the disease in uh, during the disease progression. So so the image on the top is is the one the normal person looks like, but the patient having retinal degeneration has a vision something that is shown on the bottom. So there is no peripheral vision left, but there is only central vision that might eventually be lost at some point. Uh, in previous couple of consortium projects, uh, researchers came up with a uh, with a novel molecule uh, labeled DF003 or CN03 that showed a really good protection against this photoreceptor cell death. And RISE has been part of those uh, European consortium projects. So one of the uh, the main objective was that uh, so we want to come up uh, or we want to make a delivery system for this DF003 molecule uh, and to see if the, if these nanoparticles are capable of delivering the molecule to the retinal photoreceptor cells. So in my PhD work, I tried to address three questions: how to understand and resolve the structure of lipid nanocapsules, and are these suitable for ocular application, and is the process to make lipid nanocapsules suitable for upscaling. So here is the structure of the, the drug molecule that I'm talking about. Here is the, the delivery system. So it has an oily core stabilized by uh, a, a couple of hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfactants. So, so, so here is the process to make lipid nanocapsules. So these, are, uh, these nanoparticles are formed by phase inversion process, which is free from organic solvents, and we do not need high pressures to uh, prepare the nanoparticles. So, but the nanoparticles are formed by temperature dependent changes in surfactant behavior, predominantly coliform, which is a pegylated surfactant. I'm not going to talk about detail in the process, but the first question is how to understand the structure of lipid nanocapsules. So, so, the, so the reason for doing this study is that a few few case studies have reported that these particles can have a coarser structure, but uh, the direct measurements are often missing. So we thought it would be interesting. Uh, we, it would be interesting to understand uh, the real structure of these nanoparticles. Uh, so, so we used small angle X-ray scattering and small angle neutron scattering techniques. Uh, these are advanced techniques, and the brief mechanism involves uh, sending X-rays or neutron beam, X-ray beam or neutron beam onto the sample, wherein the electrons from X-rays or neutrons interact with the sample and they get scattered at different angles based on the, the sample properties. And what we get at the end is the scattering intensity curve from, from which we can get information about size, particle shape, particle internal structure, and also many, many other things. So, so here is the, the brief data analysis. So we started analyzing SACS data first with the PFR function, which is nothing but pair distance distribution function. So the shape of the, the, the curve indicates the morphology of the nanoparticle. So here we, ob uh, we observed a bell-shaped curve, which means that the particles are spherical in nature. And based on that, we, uh, we fit the data, experimental data to a sphere model. But as you can see here, the fit lines, which are, in, which are solid lines, are completely deviating from the experimental data points. So it indicates that uh, we have sphere particles, but there is something else to it. So then we added a shell component, so the, the model becomes a coarser sphere model. And here we uh, the data fitted nicely to the experimental data points. So it confirms that we have a coarser uh, sphere model, or the particles have a coarser sphere structure. So the interesting part here is that the structure remains same both for drug loaded and unloaded particles. Um, so then, so, so likewise, we analyzed neutron scattering data, but for neutron scattering experiments, we made a series of samples uh, with very uh, with different contrasts in in core and the dispersion medium to be able to see different parts of nanoparticles. 
so so here are the outcomes from Saxon Sands study. Uh, the nanoparticles have a kosher structure, which is well retained after drug loading. So what is changing upon drug loading is that the shell thickness increases in the order of a nanometer, which is predominantly due to the, the localization of the drug on the surface. It was uh, supported by many other parameters during data analysis, along with the zeta potential. Uh, the particles, when uh, unloaded particles have a net zero, zero potential, but our, when we load the drug molecule into the particles, we see a positive zeta potential. It also confirms that the drug is sitting on the surface instead of being in the core of the nanoparticles. So the, the, ne the, the next question is, uh, are these suitable for ocular application? For this, we used uh, several in vitro and ex vivo studies. Uh, that are listed here, but I'm going to stress upon a few important uh, studies in my next slides. So the, the first one is we started with optimizing the composition. So we started varying the, in the composition of the nanoparticles or different components in the nanoparticle composition to a different uh, degrees. And what we observed was that irrespective of the composition that we had, the, the size of the particles in most of the combinations was less than 100 nanometers with a nice particle size distribution. And in most of the cases, we had the entrapment efficiency of at least 70%. Here you see uh, the cryo -TM images of these nanoparticles, and you don't really see any coarser structure. So that is, uh, so so we, uh, in the previous slides I said like we had a coarser structure, but that is not visible in cryo -TM. So we can only see from the advanced techniques like SACS and SANS. So the next one is in vitro drug list testing. So so. We wanted to understand how fast or how slow the drug might release from the nanoparticles. For this, we used a dialysis setup. And here I show uh, I show you uh, the drug diffusion again as the drug release from the nanoparticles. So what is clear here is that the drug release from the nanoparticles is quite or many times delayed compared to the drug diffusion. So it means we have sustained drug release. And the other interesting part is that when we did the release testing in phosphate buffer and also hyaluronic acid, we, we observed a similar drug release profile. The reason for using hyaluronic acid is that this, this formulation is intended for ocular application. So once the nanoparticles go into the eye, we have a matrix mostly formed by hyaluronic acid. And then when, when the particles interact with the hyaluronic acid, there might be a destabilization. We don't know. So if, if there is a destabilization of the particles, we would expect a completely different release profile. But in our case, we observed a nice profile that is similar to phosphate buffer. So it means that particles are quite stable even with the hyaluronic acid. So the next thing is we wanted to investigate if this, uh, how, how this formulation can be given uh, uh, to a patient. So, so if if we can give as a topical uh, formulation, or if we need to give it as an intravitreal injection. So, for that, we started uh, investigating the permeability of the drug compound. Uh, we for this, we used uh, pig eyes, and we ex uh, we cut the tissues of we cut corneal tissue and conjunctival tissue, and followed the permeability profile using France diffusion cell. So here, the data in blue color is uh, the permeability data from the cornea, and the other one is permeability across conjectival sclera, sclera choroid retinal complex. So what we see here is uh, the permeability of compound, it, whether it is free or it, whether it is loaded into the particles is quite slow uh, or quite poor in case of cornea, but there is a, a higher permeability across the other tissue. But overall, if you see uh, the permeability values are quite, quite low. So it means that this formulation in the current stage is not suitable for topical application. So we, we investigated further uh, to see if we can give it as an intravitreal injection. So for this, we prepared uh, the nanoparticles you know, having a fluorescent marker, and then we injected into the pig eyes intravitreally. As you can see here, we, we can see a nanoparticle cloud in the eye at T0. So at T0, we had a, a really high fluorescent intensity that drops down with time. It means that the nanoparticles have distributed across the uh, across the eye. That's why at 24 hours you don't see a, a great signal. But at 20, as here also you can see that at 24 hours you don't have any any nanoparticle cloud. So it indicates that the particles have distributed across uh, across the eye. At the end of 24 hours, we cut the uh, we cut different parts of uh, the pig eyes and we quantified the fluorescent intensity signal from different tissues of the eye. 
and this was compared against liposomes. What we observed was that from both uh, LNCs and also from liposomes, the signal was observed from almost all the parts of the eye. So it means that particles are capable of taking this uh, fluorescein marker, for example, in, uh, in our case, the drug molecule, also to uh, many other tissues like retina, uh, vitreous, uh, lens, ciliary, so almost all the tissues. So, so, so this formulation is definitely capable of uh, taking a molecule to the retinal photoreceptor cells. So the, the final slide from this uh, uh, from this uh, question is that treatment efficacy. So we want to know if this formulation can be effective against photoreceptor cell death. For this, we used uh, RT1 MOS model, which already had a retinal degeneration in the eye. So we made an explanation of that uh, eye, eye retinal culture. And here you see tunnel positive cells. It means that uh, if there is higher tunnel positive cells, it means higher cell death. So here uh, there is non-treated, it has a high cell death. When we treat this non-treated tissue uh, with uh, with our pre-drug or the, the formulation, there's a significant reduction in cell death. It means that uh, the formulation is showing a protection, protective action against photoreceptor cell death, both in case of free drug and also the formulation. The, the final question is the scalability of uh, this formulation. So, so most often we we make uh, this formula, this kind of formulations at really low volume scales, say like few milliliters. But the challenges comes up when we try to upscale it to higher scales. Uh, so, so our typical upscale volume was around like 10 milliliters. So, we we wanted to know if we can scale this formulation up to higher levels and to see if there is a change in physical chemical properties. So we investigated, uh, we, we, we upscaled to one liter and 10 liters using different process like batch process, continuous process, and also we tried to include sterilization steps in the process to be able to know the impact of different processes on the uh, scalability of this formulation. Interestingly, what we observed was that with different processes at different scales, the size distribution remained unchanged. Uh, so, so, so the size size numbers that we ob obtain at different processes is quite similar. So we can say that this process is quite uh, capable of being upscaled. And also we had uh, the formulation prepared in, 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 in this way had a stability of at least six months in solution state. So, so here is the summary of my presentation. So LNCs were found to have a coarser structure and which is well retained with drug loading and we observed sustained drug release in, in vitro. And ex vivo testing demonstrated their usefulness for ocular application, so they are suitable for further evaluation. And we were able to upscale this formulation to higher volume scales, up to 10, 10 liter volumes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, DLab, for a great presentation uh, and uh, a lovely summary. Um, would you say you have any more or, or any key takeaway? Um, Besides your summary to the audience? Um, I think the lipid formulations has a great potential and we are already seeing it now. So so there's much more. Much more we can do with lipid formulations for different molecules. That's great, and I think we have uh, someone has uh, raised his or her hand. You're welcome to take the word. Yes, thank you. Very nice presentation, Dilip. Um, I actually have two questions. So you, you showed that your LNCs you were able to scale up to quite significant volumes, which, which I think is incredibly important. <clears throat> um, but you also showed how you're manufacturing your liposomes in your first slides. So can you say anything about the scale up possibilities there? Uh with the setup that we have uh, with the microfluidic approach, we can upscale the. So it's kind of. Uh, we do not need any additional tools for, for upscaling the liposomes. So we can just increase the volume of flow, flow rates, actually. So we can use the same setup that we use at lab scale to upscale the liposomes to a higher levels without changing any uh, physical chemical properties of the formulation. So I think, as I mentioned, it's a single step process. So it's quite upscale. It's quite, it's quite easy to upscale it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And, and I think my, my other question is, is back to the LNCs. You, you've been testing these for your compound, uh, which was a, a nucleotide, which is very hydrophilic. Would you say that LNCs are a formulation for hydrophilic compounds, or can you use them more broader than that? Yes, definitely. So, so lipid, as as Bo mentioned, uh, like lipid formulations are mainly for hydrophobic compounds that have a poor uh, aqueous solubility. But but in in our case, so the the molecule is quite, kind of quite amphiphilic. Uh, I would say a little bit amphiphilic as well. It have based on its structure. So so when we started working on this, so we were not sure if it can go into because we use high temperature. So there is a possibility that the drug molecule can go into the core. So and we were assuming that it was in the core until we did the sex and sense measurements. So of course the data that we see is comparable to what we would see for the hydrophobic molecules. So 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 in in that terms, I think this formulation is really good even for the for the hydrophilic molecules. What we need to see, it could it should be studied for uh, mole I mean different molecules. So probably we need to change composition or we need to see what kind of parameters that we need to choose depending on the molecule properties. But this is uh, much more suitable for hydrophobic molecules as well. OK. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, we start with uh, Laila Malik. Uh, the question is, besides DLS, did you use other methods to verify scale up robustness? So, so, so the, I'm sorry. So the main uh, thing that we were aiming is that to see if the size distribution is similar or not, because when we upscaled it, we didn't have any rock in it. So it was just like a blank formulation. So, so so we verified the, the size measurements. We verified the poten zeta potential. Of course, they didn't have any zeta potential when there is no drug. Uh, but we did not really use any other study, uh, any any other characterization tools. So, but with size, I think size is uh, the first and foremost important thing to to know if it is scalable or not. Because if it is not scalable, then we would see a completely size, a different size distribution in the in the first step, uh, and we saw a really nice thing. And also we did the stability. So the particles are quite stable for six months, at least six months in solution state. So, but other than the LS, uh, until now, I mean, as far as uh, characterization is concerned, so we haven't used other techniques for now. Can I just add on there? Uh, sorry, this is Leila. Did, did you check the unbound bound? Uh, for the, the normal up? No, for no. the scale up. No, no, because uh, the scale of uh, the form, the scale up scale up formulation is only blank formulation, so there was no drug in it. Oh, OK, OK, thanks. Yeah, got you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question from Håkan. Do you have a theoretical model for the SACS data, both for unloaded and the drug loaded particles? It's a reference slide 10. Let me go there. So, so can you can you repeat the question for me? Of course, uh, Dilep. So do you have a theoretical model for the sex data, uh, both for unloaded and drug loaded particles? Um, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. So about the theoretical model. So but but there are like some standard models that are already fit in, in the software. Like you, you can pick like a sphere model or coarse sphere model or different models. You can already uh, select uh, that are preloaded into the software. So we can fit our data again as the preloaded models and see if it works or if it fits. But if none of the models in the software doesn't work, then we can kind of write our own script and uh, generate our more own models as well. But I haven't gone to that stage because the, the the models that are available in the software are already fine. I mean, they were fitting nice with our data. So so but but the, the model is available for this data set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good answer. Uh, great. We have another question from Dirk. So what about the stability of the API? Uh, would an 
API with core stability be more stable inside an LMP than in other formulations? I, I, I mean, the molecule is a small drug molecule, so it's quite stable. So, so, so I think the drug molecule itself is a stable compound. So without any, any formulation to it. But of course, when we load it into the formulation, so we definitely expect it to be much more stable than when there is no formulation in it. So if it is like a protein or peptide or like an mRNA, then we definitely see a big difference in stability when it is uh, loaded into the particle or when it is not loaded into the particles. But in this case, I think uh, the stability is quite, quite good. Thank you so much. So do we have any more questions in the audience? To finalize this webinar. No? All right. Well, then we, are, we have finished this webinar and uh, I would like to thank you all for listening uh, this morning and I would like to thank uh, uh, our great uh, speakers. Um, and uh, if you are interested in uh, um, related topics, I would like to recommend you to follow our, our LinkedIn channel called Drug Development at RISE, where you will, will be updated um, with, with uh, uh, for example, future uh, webinars from us. Okay, so I wish you all a happy weekend and a good Friday. Thank you so much.